I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we have come into your house to worship you today. We celebrate that with the gift of your word and Bibles, Lord. The scripture, the power of music, Lord, and prayer. And now we come to hear you. And so I ask, Lord, humbly, may we hear your words, not mine, but yours, Holy Spirit, as we look at this lesson. And Lord, today is about the motives of our heart. Not as much about the money as it is about what my desires are, what my true core values are. So Lord, help us think about that. And Holy Spirit, help us hear your message as we think about that. And just ask, Lord, that things on our mind, things that tend to distract us, only in your way, Holy Spirit, may you move them away from us so that we may hear you with gratitude and expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at these lessons from Jesus, the real question today is, where am I with my true core values? Where am I with motives when I make decisions? Where am I that, that guiding light that guides the, the depths of my soul? When the decisions are tough, something kicks in and says, this is how I will decide. If we read the passages before this, Jesus was out of the outer courts of the temple, not inside in the giving area. And he literally told the Pharisees and the scribes just before this passage, watch out for those religious leaders that wear those special robes and how they want to be noticed, but really question what their motives are. Unfortunately, I have been ordained long enough to know that pastors fail. I've also been ordained long enough to know that leaders can let us down in morally in different ways that are truly ugly at times. And I take that very, very sincere because I know that any given time the evil one would be at work to destroy any kind of spiritual movement possible. The evil one's not interested in religious practices the evil one's interested in destroying those that find Christ. And that's a real battle that happens every day we get up. And so we are asked to question, really, the motives of our soul. If you think I'm going to talk about how much money you're going to put into the plate, unfortunately, you missed the point completely. That's another time, another series. Today is really about what drives me, what helps me make decisions. Maybe a way to illustrate that, there was a car accident <coughs> excuse me, on 35W in the middle of rush hour. The family was okay, but they were unconscious. And the state trooper pulled up and saw they had a pet monkey. And that was the only thing that was conscious in the car. And the trooper thought, well, maybe I can get the accident report from the monkey. You never know. So the trooper decided to ask the monkey just to see, tell me, what was the dad doing? And the monkey went, look, 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 look. Okay, dad was drinking. All right, this is working. So he asked the monkey, what was the mother doing? And the monkey went, okay, yelling at the kids. All right, all right. What were the kids doing? He said to the monkey, and the monkey smiled. Okay, fighting. All right. Well, this is going good. All that's left is the monkey. So he thought, monkey? What were you doing? And the monkey smiled and went, <laughs> Ah, you were driving. Okay. The reason I share that, it's a good way to ask who's driving my soul? Who's driving my life? And, and how is that going? You know, Jesus has high expectations for every single one of us. And those expectations aren't set to guilt us. Those expectations are set to help us know that we have a lot of purpose and a lot of potential in life. And if we're interested in fulfilling that purpose and potential by the grace of God, it is there for us. But we can get caught up in the goals of this world. We can get caught up in prestige and power and wealth. 
And that happened in the temple in Jesus' time right there as the rich were coming in and putting what they could afford to give out of necessity to keep back what they needed, this widow comes in. But before that passage, as the verse is on the screen, verses 38 and 39, Jesus says, don't get caught up in getting a big head so we can get power and prestige in the community. We all know people that are in the community, in our circles, and when they come to us, we know their agenda. We know what they're seeking because we've been around the block long enough with them to know that they have different goals than we might have. And Jesus spells that out amongst the religious leaders. As he taught Jesus, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor and banquets. Every once in a while, someone will come up to me and they will say, Reverend, can I look around? <laughs> now, please don't use that. Why? And one person, a, a mentor came and said, you know, I like to call you Reverend. He says, why? Because it reminds you of how to truly behave at times. Puts me in my place. And there is a certain respect that demands that title. And Jesus isn't getting at that. What he's getting at is don't be a fake about it. Don't do it for just worldly prestige. Or some might say don't become a pompous windbag. Sometimes our selfishness takes over. You know, deer hunting season, bow hunting has already started. Deer hunting is going to be in November. There was a group of men that went deer hunting, about eight of them. And they had a deer hunting camp over by Crookston. And they always went there every November. And they decided every day they went hunting, they, they divided up in groups of two. So Harry went out with Bill and the others went out. At the end of the day, they're coming back to the hunting camp, back in the woods there. And Harry comes without Bill, dragging an eight-pound buck. This thing was a trophy buck. He was out of breath trying to drag it in. And, and all the others say, where's Bill? And Harry said, well, Bill had a heart attack. I left him back in the woods. He said, you left Bill back in the woods with a heart attack? Yeah, I figured no one would steal him, but they might steal the buck. <laughs> this is a fun way to, to remind us how self-centeredness can kind of step in at times and take over. And we don't pay attention to that happening in our soul until it's too late. And then we've made some decisions and we realize, whoa. That was not good. I'm going down the wrong road right now, and I know it. I realize it because of some of those decisions I made back there. And this widow comes in and reminds us, what is my motive? How far am I willing to go for Christ? How far am I willing to take it? Am I going to take it beyond Sunday morning and actually get involved in some things? Am I going to take it beyond Sunday morning and say, you know, I can attend that small group? Am I going to take it beyond some? I could help start a small group. Am I going to take it beyond some? I've always wanted to do that ministry. Maybe it's time I help make it happen. How far am I willing to go? When I was in my parish in Wyckoff and found one of the things I was able to do and I loved it because I went with the different people to see what they did at work. I cleared my schedule and I spent a day with them at work if it was able. And one of the people in that church to this day has a photo auction company. And it's a photo company that shoots prize cattle all over the world. I mean that. All the way from Brazil to Germany and also in the U.S. And he makes brochures for prize cattle so people will buy those cattle and I went with him one day because I wanted to see what he did. I've never shot cattle with a camera, I hope you understand, not a gun. And, and I went with him one day to a prized dairy farm near Black River Falls in Wisconsin. And we drove there, and I, I got the day set out in my calendar. He picked me up early in the morning. We drove over there. And when we got there, we got there. Those of you that aren't old enough, forgive me, but some of you are old enough to remember the TV show Dallas, J.R. Ewing. Shake your head, you know that. Okay, we got, we pulled in, thank you, thank you. We pulled into this 
what I was supposed to be a dairy farm, and it was more like a setting of Dallas. I kid you not. They had pillars by the house. They had a huge farm with, with apartments. I'm not making this up. I'm new to the whole dairy thing. I wasn't used to this. Apartments attached to the farm. They had a pad with a helicopter on it. I'm like, wow, this is farming. And, and I got in there, and we were taking pictures of these cows because these cows were going to be sold all over the world. And he took me out. I wanted to see what he did that day. He took me out in the field. We got this cow um, up on a little pedestal. And then I thought, how far am I willing to go? He told me to grab this brown sheet. He sprayed the cow. He, he combed the cow. He had it all groomed. This cow looked immaculate. And, and he told me to grab this brown sheet. I'm not making this up, by the way. And, and he said, come at it, the cow from a distance, Bob, and wave the sheet. I, I kid you not. I'm not making this up. And grunt. I looked at He still laughs about this. He'll tell you this is actually true. I looked at him and said, hard to find good help these days or what? <laughs> no, I'm serious. So I started, put the dumb sheet on, and it smelled like cow. And I put it on, and I started walking and flapping, and I'm grunting. Yeah, that's good, that's good. I thought, what am I, on a snipe hunt here or what? And he told me, he said, Bob, I know it sounds crazy, but you helped me get the head just the way I wanted that cow's head. And he showed me that photo about three months later. And it went all over the world. And that cow went for a lot of money. I almost called that dude at the Dallas ranch and said, I want some of that money because I helped that cow get the head turned. <laughs> I didn't do that. But sometimes we do things and we think, really, Lord? This? I have to deal with this? I mean, some of you that serve on our leadership team, you come and, and you serve, and I want you to serve. This is not to talk you out. This is to talk you into serving even deeper. And sometimes people complain, well, why do we do it that way? Or why did we make that decision? And we look up and we say, Lord, i got to deal with this. Yes. Because the motives are more important than the house cleaning at times. And the treasure was watching that, and Jesus was watching that, and that woman comes in, and she puts everything she had. She did not know where she was going to get her next meal. It was worth a lousy penny. And it was everything she had. And the rich were coming in and putting in checks with lots of zeros. And they were giving out of what they could do without. She puts everything in. Because she's willing to go far enough. And if you think this sermon's about money, you've completely missed the point. This is about our heart. This is about how far am I willing to go with my leadership? How far am I willing to go as a grandparent or a parent with my children? How far am I willing to go in my prayer life? How far am I willing to go at my place of employment? How far am I willing to go... There was a rich young ruler back in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. He had everything. And he wanted eternal life. And he, he, had, he obtained a lot early in life, and he had done it right. He didn't mess up in life. He didn't, he didn't make bad decisions. <coughs> he had done a lot of decisions with moral correctness. He comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, you got the one thing I don't have yet, and that is eternal life. What must I do to get eternal life? And he's already coming at it wrong because he thinks he can do something to purchase it. And Jesus says, very simply, you've kept all the commandments. You've done everything right so far. Just give everything to me. Give your whole life to me. Sell everything. Give your whole life. And he walks away very sad. And the disciples look at him and what, what's, what's wrong? And Jesus, verses 21 and 22, Jesus looking at him said, with love, said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. And you will have the treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the rich young ruler, when he heard this, he was shocked. He went away grieving because he had many possessions. The message version of the Bible put he was holding on too tight. And we are challenged to look at how far am I willing to go um, in many places. But the biggest thing today is don't become religious about it. The church is full of religious leaders. The church is full of people who just, just want to look good. When it comes to religious expe expectations, they play it well. And you and I were challenged 
to see really the motive of our soul as we watch this lady come in who doesn't know where she's going to get her next meal from, doesn't know how things are going to work. And she puts everything in, her all to Christ. But then Jesus sat down and saw what was going on and he watched everyone, not just her. In verse 31, he sat, 41, he sat down opposite the treasure and he watched the crowd putting money into the treasure. Many rich people put in large sums. I hate to burst your bubble, and you may not agree with this, and sometimes when I pay bills, I don't agree with this, but the very fact that we're sitting here today in America, we're about 5 to 10, 15 percent of the population, it's about 5 percent of the population's wealth. Now, I understand you're looking at me, well, if we're 5 percent of the population's wealth, Pastor, where is it for me? I get that. At times when we don't know how we're going to pay bills. But we're on the other side of the crowd here today. We're the ones that have the abundance by the very fact that we've been given this country and all the wealth and everything we have to grab onto. This widow comes in, she's got nothing. Nothing at all. And she gives everything she has. And you and I, we are challenged not to think about this as a money thing, but to think about this in the motive of our heart and our life. What's really left is as for our motives, what about our Christ-centered attitude? This isn't a guilt, it's just to think about it and see where we're driving towards each week. When we wake up tomorrow, what is going to be the motive of my heart when I wake up? Am I going to be perfect? Not a chance. But grace is going to abound, and it's going to help me make decisions, and it's going to help me get discipled. If my motive is correct, it's going to help me get discipled and mature towards Christ. And you and I are challenged with that as we look at how far we're going with Christ-centered gratitude. There was a young man who found Christ. He was in his early 30s. And he found Christ. He really found Christ. He found salvation. He found grace. He felt like he had purpose for the first time in his life. And he was walking along and down below, the devil in one of his cohorts noticed this young man finding purpose, life, everything in Christ. And the cohort said to the devil as they looked above at him, they said, what are you going to do about that? The cohort of the devil was like, aren't you worried? He just found salvation. He just found purpose. He just found the Holy Spirit. And the devil just smiled, no. I'll just see to it that he makes a religion out of it. You see... Christ has backed this passage with this widow and, and read it all this week in your, in your quiet time. Read the whole chapter. He backed this passage up in Mark's gospel with a challenge not to become religious. And the challenge really is, is, is to see how far we want to go in the motives of our heart. And that's hard every day. That's not easy to do. It's hard to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to be excited for Christ today when we're being attacked in certain nitpicking ways. It's hard to say, I'm going to be excited for Christ today when it's hard to get excited at all. And so you and I are challenged to think about that today as we look at this widow who comes in. I can remember back when I was in college. And my parents, I, I love them, I love them, I'm grateful for them, I always will be. But we just didn't have the funds in our household to pay for college. So I was, I was on my own my last two years. <coughs> they helped, and they helped a lot. But there were times where I can remember, especially going into grad school, we just learned to enjoy, Kelly and I, macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. I don't want to see macaroni and cheese and hot dogs again because I remember how many weeks I ate that because it's what we could afford. You will find that I don't like Kool-Aid. There's nothing wrong with Kool-Aid, folks. It's great. Kind of hold off on the sugar. But I don't like Kool-Aid because I can remember when we just didn't have enough money for pop. Not that that's good for you. But pop was, was a treat in our household when I was in grad school because Kool-Aid was affordable. I can remember looking at Kelly and thinking at the end of two weeks, Kool-Aid again? Yes, it's what we can afford. And you know, I'm not saying that to complain or say, woe is me. Don't, don't, you're missing the point. I'm saying that because when I look back 
We didn't suffer those years. God provided. Mac and cheese and hot dogs were fine. Because God had a greater goal for Kelly and I. And provided. Now once in a while, we'd get a check from my mom and dad. And we'd go to the Dairy Queen and we thought we had the world by the tail. I tell you that. You want to talk about a royal treat. No pun intended. <laughs> it was good. But you see, God provided through all of that. I remember one time as I in, I preached about seven miles out of town of Greenville, Illinois. I don't know if you've ever been there, Sorrento and Donaldson. If you've been there, Party City. I think Mary Jane, there was like 20 people in Donaldson, the whole town. <laughs> and I preached every Sunday. And I had to get there with my little pickup I had. I had a Chevy Love pickup. And it was broken down. It needed an alternator situation. And I just did not have the money to fix it. And I, I just didn't know what to do. I literally did not know what to do. Because it kind of happened right away. And I needed to get it fixed in a couple of days. So I prayed. I didn't know what to do. Because I had to get out to that church. One of the ladies that was at the Methodist Church in Donaldson was one of the business managers at the college. She was in her 60s. And I was, I kid you not, I never talked to her about the truck. I just prayed. I was walking to chapel one day. We had routine chapel at Greenville College. And I, I always, that particular day, by way of my classes, passed through the business office. And Kathleen was her name. She came out and said, oh, and, and I, don't, I wasn't ordained yet, but they called me Pastor Bob. So anyway, Pastor, I said, yeah, I was praying this morning. Okay. Now, I'm young. I'm like 20, 22, 23 years old. Okay. And, I, and this lady taught me everything. I just felt the Lord tell me, I don't know why, I just felt com compelled, passionate to give you this check. Okay. And she handed me a check, and I'm not making this up. As God is my witness, I'll always remember this. It was for the exact amount that I needed to fix my truck up to a dollar more. Over the change. And I just looked at her and I said, Did you talk to one of the mechanics? No, no, I haven't talked to you. I just felt this is what you need. And I was just overblown with God's passionate way of providing. I obviously took the truck, I told her, fixed the truck, everything was fine. And I figured out once again how God can provide. If we're willing to just put our motives towards Christ and get beyond religion. The challenge today is, is not about how much money you drop into the offering plate. We need that. Don't get me wrong. I still need you to do that. We need to pay our bills. The challenge today is about our heart. The challenge today is about asking myself, Bob Candles, how far am I willing to go? For the salvation that I've been given. What is the motive of my heart? And as they were in the temple, Jesus says, For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, I just come to you today in my own heart with just a little bit of guilt, knowing your grace is far greater than that, but sometimes, Lord, guilt is a good thing. And so I just bring these areas to you that I need to work on. You know what they are. And you know what they are for each of us, Lord. And as we give them to you in prayer at this moment, it's not as much about guilt as it is about you smiling and saying, don't worry, I'm going to help you with it. It's you saying, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to get you into the gym of faith. And I'm going to put you on the weights. And I'm going to exercise you. And these things are going to get worked out. And grace will abound above all else. Lord, help us lift our motives to you. 
Help us lift up every area of our life and just be honest and say, help me, Lord. We don't have to correct it all today. But just one day at a time, help us become this widow who gave everything to you. We want to give our lives to you, Lord. We do not want to become victims of religious habit. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as we find ourselves at the end of September 2015, we really do say to you, Lord, help us, Holy Spirit. Help us become more godly. And we know you hear us, Lord. We know your grace abounds. We know you're there. We know you're in this house. We know you're right here right now. So help us do it tomorrow, Lord, as well as today in Jesus' name. Amen.